Okay, so thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ron. I'm the director of editorial at Jove. Um, so today we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Sebuela. Um, so he he published a paper with us in 2019 on slice cultures from the adult human brain. And today he's going to be talking about some recent developments and slight variations um, to the protocol. And, you know, feel free to ask questions um, and we'll do a Q&A towards the end. And I can also say that we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar afterwards. And, um, you know, you're welcome to follow up with any questions through that email as well. Okay, so I will leave it to you, Dr. Sebuela. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, thank you. Uh, all the, the job team for, for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's a privilege for me to be sharing uh, our, our work with you here in, in the following up of the, the video article we have published with you in, in 2019. So yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for joining this session. So So, and so as Ronald mentioned and, and I just mentioned, yeah, this is the, the video article we have published uh, describing this, this methodology we have been working on in the past, let's say, six or seven years in, in my lab. Right. So the, the idea was to uh, uh, prepare slice cultures from, from adult human tissue obtained right, in, the, in the hospital here. Right? So we have this uh, capability here because we are, we are very close to the, to the hospital. So yeah, we have the possibility of getting tissue and, and our work uh, our efforts were to develop this method to prepare uh, slice cultures and a specific uh, uh, methodology to uh, culture this tissue in, in a free floating uh, condition. So there is no uh, membrane inserts involved, uh, which makes this, this protocol uh, simple and really cost effective compared to others. And the reason for that is that our biological questions that we are interested in our lab are, they, they uh, don't require long-term cultures. So uh, when you say short-term here, we mean like less than 10 days in culture. And for this time period, this free float in slice cultures, the way we have developed them are, are uh, good enough, you know, healthy for our experiments. So, yeah. So, and and what is the purpose? What is the motivation for preparing this culture from human brain? So, the main one is that, as you all know, most of the the data available in the literature uh, on on mechanism of uh, brain diseases. They have been obtained using rodent-derived models, and the rodent brain uh, is really different from the human brain. Uh, not all, not all, in terms of, of cross morphology, of course, but uh, also and more importantly, in terms of uh, cell types and cell specificities and cellular functions. Uh, comparing this, this two tissue. So here is an example of, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a, a good example of, in a recent one, like, yeah, it's a recent paper showing uh, a difference in gene expressions, gene expression patterns of uh, important uh, proteins like neurotransmitter, receptors and, and adhesion proteins uh, between mouse and, and human cortex. Okay, so 
considers, uh, even when uh, these authors compare uh, uh, similar cell types in this two tissue, okay, so uh, they detected this uh, significant differences in, in, in gene expression of important neurotransmitter receptors. So this is a clear evidence of, of the difference we should expect when we use mouse or brain tissue as a model to investigate mechanism in, in brain diseases. And if more recently, the same group uh, published another paper showing uh, striking differences in terms of special distribution uh, of cell types in, in brain cortex between human and mouse and cellular interaction. So here there is, uh, we can see, these are different cell types. For, if you look, for example, to excitatory neurons, we see they are much more abundant in, in mouse cortex than in human. Uh, and the opposite for oligodendrocytes here in, in pink. So there are more oligodendrocytes than uh, in, in human than in mouse tissue. And even more importantly, there is uh, a huge difference in terms of contacts between cells. So here they measured uh, contacts between microglia cells and neurons uh, and uh, aligning with this new view of participation of uh, microglia in, in synaptic uh, stability. For example, there is a uh, significant number of contacts between neurons and microglial cells in humans, but virtually no contact or very low levels of contacts in, in, in mouse brain. So these are motivations for us, and I think they are very robust, to keep working with uh, human tissue as a preferred model in our lab. And one can think, okay, so how about alternative human-derived models like brain organoids? Are they better than uh, human brains like cultures as we prepare? And, and of course, we are comparing here with brain organoids because they are the most uh, famous uh, option uh, currently. And, and the best answer here is depends. Depends on, on, the, on the problem under investigation. So if, if uh, one is uh, using uh, these models to investigate uh, or to discover mechanism in underlying uh, diseases typical of the aged brain, a mature brain, not a brain in, in, in development, I would say that uh, the model we use, this uh, tissue derived uh, brain cultures are more efficient in terms of representing a, a real phenomenon than brain organites, at least uh, with the current technology. Of course, someday, eventually, this brain organoids may become uh, more uh, uh, efficient in terms of resembling uh, an aged brain. And there are a number of efforts in this towards this, this goal. Uh, but currently, I think, yeah, this tissue derived are, are important. And here it's uh, a reason for us, uh, uh, one more reason for us to keep working with this. Because if you look at the papers published in the past, uh, five or six years uh, uh, after the brain organoids uh, became more popular, what we can see is an explosion in in papers published using brain organoids uh, uh, and a stability or a trend to a reduction in the number of papers using a tissue slice culture. So, and and I think this is not good because. Again, in the current uh, state of the art, I would say that these models, they, are, they kind of uh, uh, supplement, complement each other. So, okay, so let's talk about our protocol. So the, the, the main uh, inspiration, let's say, was this paper published back in 20, in early 2000s. 
uh, by uh, Tick Swab's group, uh, showing uh, healthy neurons or viable neurons in slices culture for 20 days, uh, slices prepared from post-mortem human tissue. So we uh, didn't uh, have access for, for operational uh, limitations. We can't use, uh, were not possible for us to use post-mortem tissue. So we kind of, uh, adapt this protocol, their protocol, uh, for preparing cultures from tissue obtained from resective surgeries, uh, particularly uh, from uh, 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 temporal lobe epilepsy patients, because there is uh, this kind of epilepsy is uh, in, in most cases restricted to uh, medulla and hippocampus and the surgeons need to uh, resect the cortical area to uh, have access to the epileptic zone. So this tissue, which is healthy tissue, it's usually discarded. Part of it is used for pathological pathology, but uh, a significant part is, is not used. So we started collecting, uh, started this partnership with surgeons and collect part of this tissue, take them to the lab and prepare the, the cultures. So, and since I started my own lab here in uh, Sao Paulo, University of Sao Paulo, we uh, were successful in establishing this, this partnership with the hospital. And uh, this is an overview of the protocol we have been doing here since in the past five or six years. So we collect tissue in the surgical room. We transport it to the lab uh, as quick as possible. It takes for us it takes like 15 minutes. Um, the whole process during the whole process of transportation, <clears throat> the tissue is uh, kept uh, in culture region, oxygenated culture region. Uh, in the lab, we remove as much as possible uh, outer uh, membranes glue the tissue uh, and here there's a fragment of the video article actually. So we glue the tissue in, in agarose uh, and then prepare for slicing. This is our fibrotone. Uh, so the tissue is sliced in 200 micrometer uh, slices and then we collect these slices and transfer them uh, to uh, 24 uh, well plates for, for assays like functional now assays, viability, imaging. So uh, after five days in vitro, uh, the tissue is, uh, the, the, the overall architecture is, is, is good. We can see cortical layers. We can see the expected neurons, microglia, astrocytes. We have seen oligodendrocytes are there too. And, 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 and they are functional in terms of responding to a stimulus uh, like uh, chemical depolarization of potassium. So we measured this looking at uh, iron phosphorylation. It's a map kinase signaling protein. And as you can see here, uh, Slices um, <clears throat> stimulated with potassium uh, show an increase in active solidation. So they are they are responding to stimulus. Uh, we also did this experiment, but using uh, uh, instead of chemical depolarization, we use an, uh, an agonist of glutamate receptor, which is the main excitatory receptor uh, in the human brain. And we obtained similar results on increasing air phosphorylation. And uh, this increase was uh, reversed uh, or was blocked by uh, any NMT receptor antagonist. So, yeah, the whole uh, glutamate uh, neurotransmitter system was preserved in these slides, in these slices. Uh, so, more recently, we are. Uh, working on improving viability along a long period in culture 
and of course uh, our human tissue is, is too pressure so we are using a rat tissue to test this and what we are doing is to incubate instead of uh, regular incubation we are using this uh, platform to uh, add some uh, mild uh, agitation to the to the slice uh, with the, the propose of improving uh, uh, availability of oxygen and nutrients to the cells and and the result at least with rat tissue has been very very uh, promising uh, as you can see here in blue uh, tissue uh, culture in my agitation uh, show it uh, higher uh, viability than the regular incubation so we are about to test this with human tissues so now uh, i'm gonna show to you some examples of what uh, you can uh, obtain in terms of results the applications okay of course i'm going to use examples from my lab but i think they are a good representation of what we one can do with this this uh, model so uh, we we work here in, in, in the lab with uh, beta ligomers, which are famous for their neurotoxicity involved in, in Alzheimer's disease. So what we did here was to expose the, the, the slices to uh, in vitro pre prepared a beta ligomers. And as you can see here, we saw a robust binding and the question was okay so if there is binding we should see uh uh, uh hallmark pathology hallmark of the disease which is tau hyperphosphorylation um, and yes using two different uh epitopes classically uh, involved in, in neurodegeneration in at we saw an increase uh, in in tau hyperphosphorylation in uh, a better legal was exposed to the slices. So the message here is that yes, we can kind of mimic a ABO's toxicity with these cultures, and they are now uh, uh, very promising, let's say, or relevant uh, platform to look for novel therapeutic and neuroprotective strategies for AT. So another uh, effort here in the lab has been studying a virus infection using this model. So far we have tested two uh, different emergent viruses. Uh, one is, is the Oropoche virus, which is uh, endemic in, in Central and South America, and SARS-CoV-2, which everyone knows, unfortunately. And, uh, uh, both of them have been uh, uh, reported to be involved to, to elicit uh, neurological uh, uh, complications in part of the of the patient. So this is the the, the rationale for us to to, to uh, use this two virus so far. And the experimental design is it's very simple. We just uh, expose the, the, the culture of the slices to, to viral preparations uh, at uh, days in vitro two the virus are uh, the incubation of the virus lasts two hours and we keep this uh, slices for additional 24 or 48 hours after infection and then a number of readouts are possible including imaging viability etc so here are some uh, representative results. Uh, we saw a very robust infection with Oropoche virus uh, in our uh, slices. It was time dependent and uh, reaching almost 15% of the cells infected after 48 hours. It's a really important uh, degree of infection. And we were also uh, also uh, 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 
we could also uh, de de determine the main uh, cell types, uh, the main targets of oropoch infection in this tissue uh, using uh, co-labeling with uh, neural markers. So uh, we saw that uh, microglia is, is the preferred cell type for uh, this virus. So uh, more than 30% of microglial cells uh, in our tissue were infected. And neurons were infected too, but at a significant lesser extent. And we did the same with SARS-CoV-2, except by the fact that we had to use a different uh, biosafety uh, measurements. Uh, and again, we saw uh, infection using uh, both uh, an antibody against SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and double strand RNA uh, infection compared to MOC. It was a magnification. Uh, this infection was time dependent to using uh, PCR for for viral genome, and again. able to determine the astrocyte, the, the main uh, infected cell type. And here, see the, see how specific is the process. So here, for a different virus, the main uh, uh, cell type infected was astrocytes, which were not infected at all by, by Oropoche, uh, as you can see here for double, double labeling. But uh, the total number of cells were, was, uh, and the total number of infected cells was significantly lower than for a poach. Only 5% of the cells were infected by SARS-CoV-2. And among them, 6% uh, were uh, GFAP positive, so were uh, astrocyte cells. And uh, here we're also uh, uh, able to see a significant uh, expression, overexpression of, of uh, uh, genes related to pro-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, based on what uh, the literature and we all know about SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, inducing a strong uh, pro-inflammatory uh, Stimulus. So yeah, we 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 saw the same here. At least looking at these three pro-inflammatory cyt cytokines, we saw the same uh, uh, when our slices were infected by SARS-CoV-2. So yeah. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to emphasize some of these uh, achievements and perspectives to summarize for you guys what we have been doing. So. Uh, we can say that this uh, slice is culture in free floating. At least for five days, they preserve structure and function. And we are currently working uh, to extend this period in culture to, let's say, 10 to 14 days in vitro um, using this uh, uh, shaking. Uh, we were able to, to uh, model virus brain infections and pathologies. Uh, which is uh, ABO AT related pathology in this tissue. And, and this, in our view, has a, a very uh, interesting translational uh, power because we are looking to responses uh, provided by a tissue that is a, an actual mini brain, let's say, because the connections and and the cell type diversity is the same as the adult human brain. And finally, uh, if I would say, if I'll have to point an ad a disadvantage of this model is the, uh, the difficulty in obtaining tissue, of course, it's not easy anywhere in the world. So what we are working on here is to uh, 
extend our collaboration with uh, the hospital uh, to be able to collect tissue from other resective surgeries uh, in addition to epilepsy. Uh, and an example is brain tumor where when, when, when there is a case of a restricted uh, tumoral tissue, uh, there is also the need for uh, uh, removing a healthy tissue which is, is not used for other purposes. So there is a, an opportunity here for us to collect tissue from this surgeries too. And there are groups in the world doing this. So, all right. Said I'd like to thank everybody for the for the attention and and the the group I I work I coordinate in the University of São Paulo in particular to Glaucia Almeida and Giovanna Nogueira which are PhD students working with me that are fully dedicated to the project involving this uh, distinction so. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, thank, thank you for the great presentation. And so now we can answer a couple of questions. Um, so, so far there's two in the Q&A section if you wanna address those. Okay. Uh, so there are questions here. Uh, Compare it to the protocol originally proposed a year ago, in my house it works, is your method cheaper um well if there is what i can say here is that if there is no membrane inserts involved it will it, it's cheaper okay it, it, it always will be cheaper if there is no membrane inserts because they are expensive and 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 they are uh uh one way you use so uh, yeah compared to any method using membrane inserts our method is is cheaper uh, but again if depending on your uh, question you have to use a membrane insert if you are looking for a long-term culture or or some sort of uh, very high resolution images, you may need uh, this uh, methods using membrane inserts. Oh, and there is a, another point here, uh, which is the culture medium. I haven't mentioned anything, uh, 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 any information about culture medium. And I know there are, there are methods, uh, published methods, which require special formulations Okay, so this may be more complicated to prepare and, and more expensive too. So we use a commercial, uh, we only use commercial uh, media, of course, uh, neuronal friendly media, but commercial one and, and, and supplemented with uh, commercial commercially available supplements and and bdnf which is a, a growth factor that we have seen uh, it's it's important for keeping uh, neurons uh, functional so this is is the only uh, uh, let's say more expensive factor that we have been using but it's commercially available we can look for uh, different providers so And another question, what was the thickness of slices? Uh, it's true. We, actually, yeah, we can prepare a different uh, thickness. Uh, the common one in the lab is 200 micrometers. And the reason for that is uh, since we are using this uh, free floating format, uh, thicker slices would not be ideal we will have a significant cell death in in a significant part of the the slice if it was 
thick, like 400 micrometers. But yes, we can use 300 micrometers, 250. It's it's okay too for this protocol. Okay. Uh, is your incubator? Where is it? <laughs> okay. So there was uh, another part of the question I I haven't answered. So we can go back to it later. Uh, would compromised tissue morphology uh, affect the expression of T membrane receptors of it if using the chemical uh, techniques? I'm not sure if I understood properly this question. So, yeah, we have used uh, standard stochemical techniques and haven't seen any uh significant problem so uh, if you uh, uh watch the the video article you see that there is a a final part of it fully dedicated to to preparation of thin slices for for immunohistochemistry thin sections for immunohistochemistry it, it's not easy because we start from a tissue that is already uh uh same. So I would say that you should follow uh, some uh, important tips that we have provided in the video article for preparing your thin sections for immunohistochemistry. Point. Uh, so uh, have you tried to attach slices to membrane in certain gently agitate? Mm, no. That's a that's a good possibility. Yeah, the, the point is we have in the past we have purchased the, the 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 inserts, and the idea was to compare both. But the results were so good using the free floating format that we just stopped using the the inserts. But yeah, that that could work. The the, the point is that for, for uh, the slices usually uh, attach very strongly to the inserts after a couple of days and this is important for some some sort some kinds of imaging uh, uh, technology so we don't want that right for our experiments we don't want to have the the slice strongly attached to the, to the insert this is why we are not using it um, can you perform immunofluorescent slices? Yes, we have. I, I, I have showed to you a number of immunofluorescent results for for virus, for for example, using yeah, immunofluorescent either confocal uh, or uh, multiphoton. Yeah, you can. Have I checked the transcriptomic effect of the medium on the slice? No, that's a very good point. Yeah, we we should that do that uh, uh, even because there are a number of very interesting cultural medium formulations available in the literature so yeah a, a good experiment would be to compare uh, using a transcriptomic approach or proteomic uh, the difference using the different medium yeah that would be a very nice uh, experiment Okay, well, it looks like that's it as far as questions. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sebuela, for a, a fantastic presentation here. And thank you to everyone attending, um, coming up with a lot of great questions. Um, so we will, we did record this webinar and we'll be sending out the recording to all the attendees. And, um, you know, so you have that for your records and feel free to ask us any questions uh, by email. Um, you know, if you have any questions about the protocol, any questions about Jove in general, uh, feel free to reach out to us. All right. Well, thank, thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much, Ron. Yeah, I'd like just to emphasize that if there are any other questions, please email me and I'll be happy to, to answer. All right. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.